Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred, and today I'm going to do an excerpt from Martha Sweezy's Internal Family Systems Therapy for Shame and Guilt. We're almost done with this book. <laughs> Can you believe it? Uh, there's so so many treasures in here. Uh, but this this one is called Griffin's Depression Team. So this is going to be really helpful if you or a loved one or a client um, suffer from depression. So Griffin was a 24-year-old cisgender single Chinese Canadian. His family was from Hong Kong, but he had Canadian citizenship and had gone to boarding school in Canada and stayed. He was now in graduate school in the United States. He started therapy as China was instituting martial law in Hong Kong, but he said he had a long history of feeling blue for several months at a time. So Griffin's manager says, comes into the session and says, I'm depressed. Again, um, you know, a lot of these parts that are showing up in really big ways for a person will just identify as that, right? I am depressed. And Martha says, how do you know? And Griffin's manager says, I have no interest in things, right? Just this lack of motivation, apathy, which can be um, a big part of depression. But I like Martha's question, how do you know? Because she's she's searching for um, what specifically is happening. What is the evidence, right? In, in nonviolent communication, we talk about how there's, a label, right? Like something, a judgment, an evaluation, right? Depressed, depression. Because what do you mean by that? What's the evidence, the facts, right? That lead you to say, I am depressed. It would be the same as, you know, when someone says, I believe in God. And they say, what is God to you, right? Define what that means to you. All right. So, he says, I don't have interest in things. And Martha says, what else do you notice? And Griffin's manager says, you mean like thoughts? Martha says, thoughts, beliefs, sensations, emotions, actions, urges. So she's inviting him to just really be observant about all these things that might point him toward this label of depression. So Griffin's manager says, I think a lot about how it's too late. And then he pauses. I feel heavy, like someone put a weighted blanket over my head and I can't get out from under it. And Martha says, is that one part or two? Again, just curiosity around, you know, there's a part that feels like it's too late. And then this weighted blanket, is that one or two? Griffin considers it and says two, but they are allies. And here, I don't know if Griffin did this, but you can always just ask directly inside, right? Get in touch with the part that's saying it's too late, it's too late, and the, the weighted blanket and ask, are you one part or two? And it will tell you directly. And he says, they're two, but they're allies. And Martha says, how do you feel toward them? And he says, smothered. So Martha says, can we talk with them? Griffin says, no, they don't recognize me. So again, either he's blended with another part or they just don't know the self. So Martha says, okay, is it okay if I talk and you listen? So she's going to attempt direct access here. Um, I think she's sensing that he's blended with other parts. So Griffin nods and Martha says, so I want to talk with Griffin's depression team. Are you there? And Griffin nods. And she says, what do you do for Griffin? Griffin's depression team says, we protect him. Yep. And she says, how old do you think Griffin is? Griffin's depression team says 12. And Martha, Martha says, there is a grown-up Griffin who could help the 12-year-old. A griffin who's not a part. Do you want to meet him? The depression team says no. And Martha says, how come? And so the depression team says, what about us? And so Martha says, 
he would help you too. We don't want to get rid of you, though I realize that other parts probably do. Is that right? So she's assessing for the concern, right? Why don't you want to get to know Griffin's adult self? And they're saying, what about us? Which is usually a big concern of protective parts is they think that if the self comes in, that they are going to be obliterated or um, exiled or, you know, put aside somehow, and they don't want that. So she's assuring them that that's not what would happen. Um, so she's saying, you know, he would help you too. He's not going to get rid of you. And, and then she recognizes there are probably parts inside of him, though, that have tried to get rid of you. Is that right? And they say yes. And Martha says, well, they just see what you do, not who you are. But that would change if they can meet you. So the depression team says, we don't trust you. Martha says, okay, that's fair enough. Uh, tell us what you want for Griffin. So um, again, she's not pushing back. She's not arguing and saying, well, you should trust me. And this is why necessarily she's just continually continuing to show up in self, to show up with curiosity, to know that they have a good intention and that she wants to know that. So she's saying, tell, tell me what you do for Griffin. Like, what is your good intention? How are you for him? And the depression team says, he could get angry. Martha says, and you don't want him to get angry. And the depression team says, no, it's not safe. But if he's not angry, he feels helpless. So this is often the case that um, parts that show to depress a person are actually polarized with other parts. Um, and this is why, you know, you're here bipolar or manic depression or that kind of thing. There's parts that are hyper aroused, right? That, which could be anxious parts, angry parts, uh, really, just really elevated parts. And so the depression is trying to achieve balance by pulling down into hypo arousal, right? And like Dick Schwartz says, a polarization is a burden system's way of trying to achieve balance. But usually it goes back and forth like this, right? The hyper aroused parts, the hypo aroused parts. Um, take charge back and forth. So the depressed part is pointing toward angry parts, part or parts, um, and, and feels like it's not safe. So they're revealing their good intention. I don't want this angry part to come out. And so Martha says, uh, and this is, and then if, if he's not angry, he feels helpless. And so Martha says, and that's not good either. And the depression team says, no. Martha says, what happens when he feels helpless? She says, he wants to die. Mm, yep. And so Martha says, so you don't want him to feel angry or helpless or want to die. So she's really uncovering this good intention. They're polarized not only with angry parts, but with helpless, maybe even suicidal parts. So this is always the case, right? Especially with firefighter parts, but with all parts that they're saying, I know what I'm doing seems bad, but if I don't do this, what will happen is even worse. That's what a lot of the other parts inside don't understand. Um, and so Griffin's depression team says, yeah, that's right. We don't want him to feel at all. So their solution to him feeling angry or helpless, despair, right, is let's just not feel at all because parts are very extreme. Again, it's like we feel really big or we feel nothing. They don't know kind of that nuanced both end space that self can, can be in because they're very young, right? They, they have had to be this extreme. Uh, so, so Martha says, if the Griffin who's not a part could help the angry part and the helpless part, would you need him to be depressed? Like if the angry part and the helpless part weren't so extreme, would you need to be so extreme? And the depression team says, no, probably not. And so she's offering hope, this kind of hypothetical here. What if Griffin's self, who's not a part, could help these parts? Could you relax? Yes. So this is often what happens in a polarization 
is that if you go to one extreme and they point to other parts who are extreme, you can say, what if I or the client self help whatever they're protecting or help them so that they can relax, then could you relax? And they say, yes, yes, please, right? Please help. And that's really the way to de-escalate that big polarization in a person's system. Um, so again, Martha keeps giving hope. She says, I'm confident that he can help those parts, but don't take my word for it. Meet the Griffin who's not a part and you can decide for yourself. Uh, we're always encouraging autonomy. Don't just believe anything, right? Experience it, experiment with it. See if you can trust it. And Griffin's depression team says, what about the parts who try to get rid of us? Good question. And Martha says, let's ask them what they want for Griffin. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Griffin says they want me to be safe. So they feel like the depression is not safe. Sounds like. And again, they have kind of a very similar intention. So Martha says, does the depression team argue with that? And Griffin says, no. So Martha says, so ultimately everyone has the same goal. This is often what happens in polarizations too, is they begin hearing each other's intentions and realize they actually have very similar intentions or similar goals. They have good things that they want for the client and bad things they don't want for the client. And so they can kind of find common ground there. And Griffin says, yes, but they don't trust each other. So Martha says, well, that makes sense because they don't agree on how to be safe. And that's why they need your help, right? It's like, it really is like you have these two warring factions, right? Or two children who are arguing and you as the adult or the mediator can come and say, okay, let's hear both of you out. And you may have the very same goal, but you have very different strategies about how to meet the goal. So let me be the mediator, hear you both out, right? This one says, we need to take you completely out for you to be safe. This one says, but you need to be hypervigilant or have energy to be safe and say, okay, you both have the same goal of keeping Griffin safe, right? Let's see if we can find a way that you can both agree on or find some middle ground, right? So the self can really act as a mediator there. And, and really either of them cannot back down until what they protect is healed, right? So the self can offer that. What if I go to the parts who are stuck in probably those helpless parts, right? A time when they felt really helpless or something not okay was happening or something that caused panic was happening. Let me get them out of that time. Let me witness them. Let me unburden them. And then you don't have to protect them in such extreme ways anymore. Okay. Um, so Martha's last note here is when the client presents with a, one thing leads to the next cascade of reactivity. For example, we don't want him to feel angry, but if he's not angry, he feels hopeless and he wants to die. So we make him depressed. Uh, Martha says, don't let it interfere with your approach. You have the benefit of knowing two things that the client's parts don't yet understand. First, that all protectors in one system want their person to be safe and feel lovable. And second, that connecting with the self will immediately convince them of something they will not otherwise understand. This burning building has an exit. Ooh, beautiful. I love the way she says that. Yeah, so your self has the benefit of understanding that um, that first of all, every, every protector has a good intention, basically. You know, even if you see the negative impact and the extreme nature of it, the depression, the anger, the suicidality, you know that it has a good intention somehow of keeping that person safe or keeping them lovable. And so you can go in with that curiosity and you know this hope, this effectiveness that once they meet the self, that the self is capable of healing what they protect. And so just having this knowledge, um, being in self yourself as, as the practitioner is really the most important thing. 
because you will hold that perspective. You will know they have good intention. You will know there is hope uh, of healing and that the person's self is capable of that. And you can hold that out very confidently and clearly. So um, if you or a loved one or a client um, is suffering from depression or perhaps uh, bipolar or manic depression or you know anxiety and depression, a lot of times that's very common. And so if you have any questions or comments about this example, please leave them in the comment section below.